Hi, everyone. Today I'm uh, interviewing Co de Clute, and this is his book, Frank and Co. And this is a Conversations with Frank Zappa from 1977 to 1993. This is a fantastic book. Just want you to know that. I'm sure you you probably already know that. I'm holding it up so everyone can see it. Um, so the the first question I want to ask you is, and this is a, maybe a big one, but I feel like you're you're capable of answering this. I'll try. <laughs> Why is Frank Zappa important? I think that he is important, like other people as well, who are in his league, uh, because he shows you that um, if you are devoted to your talents and if you are willing to invest time and effort mm -hmm. and emotion into exploring those talents, you can add something to the world and you can add something to the world of art or maybe even to the world in general. And uh, the reason why he's still such a vital factor for many, if you if you look on the internet, so many yeah. Zappa groups are there and people constantly communicate with each other about his role and what he put out. Um, I think that he is um, truly one of the contemporary Renaissance artists who says that, um, well, his his own his own motto, you know, that you can do anything for no reason at all, just as long as your intentions are uh, of a positive nature. And I've always seen him as a very positive force. So that's why I think he's important in arts, in music. Of course, he has um, expanded boundaries. He has uh, he has a whole list of premieres on his name. Yeah, things that he did as an entrepreneur, as a pioneer, and uh, he did it with total devotion. So I, uh, that's why I think he's important. He really made a difference. Are there like specific moments of your interaction with Frank um, that either didn't make it into this book or are in this book that are really important to you that sort of stand out as key moments in your relationship that you built with him? Well, there's, there's stuff that happened that is not in yeah. the book because I found it too personal or, sure. you know, it's not a gossip book. Yeah. And, um, well, just to, can I jump in? Like what made you decide what was too personal? Like, are there things about your, cause I noticed in this book, like there's not a lot of discussion of Frank asking you about yourself, right? Like friendship is a two way street. It's a lot of your questions with him. You're obviously interviewing him, but what was that relationship on the other end? Like you said, he, he encouraged you as you were going to the conservatory and early in your career. Did you feel like he was invested in you in other ways? Well, you know, he was interested, and uh, I once I make I also make music, and uh, I. It's funny that you should point this out because I can't even remember if that's in the book. But um, did you ever play music for him or any show him any? I gave I, gave I gave I gave him uh, recordings I did with Menno. Yeah. And then one evening he called me up in my house here in Holland and about something. Mm -hmm. And he says, by the way, I listened to your music and I got some comments on that because I like this piece, but, 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 but this piece needs a band and this piece is a, because we were a duo. Yeah. He pointed out some pieces and he says, you should do that with a band. And yeah. then when I hung up the phone, I said, okay, listen, did I just get musical <laughs> advice from Frank Zappa? Yeah. Okay. Let's have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> and then we formed a band. All right. And then later I gave the uh, the CD and he laughed and uh, so I uh, know, but of course it, well, he was always very supportive and, and, and interested, but it was, it was also a lot of work. I mean, I did yeah. work and uh, he gave me opportunities, you know, with the, when his last big project, the yellow shark, he just arranged for me to have the radio world premiere of that thing. It was incredible. Yeah. On, on Dutch radio. And when I was got in touch with the, uh, with the uh, German organizers, they were very, very difficult about it and said, well, we don't know if we can. So yeah, but Frank says it's okay. So yeah. that was it. <laughs> Done. Done. <Yeah. laughs> now, sorry to, to go into that other question. What, what are some of the moments that are in the book or those interactions that really you feel like defined your, your friendship or relationship with him? Well, you know, it's, 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 it's just the, 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 the warmth and the, uh, you know that incident that happened in '79 when with the press conference, where all these yeah. people were asking those stupid questions. He says, "Why, why don't you come over to my hotel tonight? You know, we'll we'll be together." And and that was then. Um, and do you think he gave you that time to to talk to him one on one, because he knew that you actually cared? I cared. He also knew I would put it on the radio, yeah. and he preferred radio to the written press always mm -hmm. because you couldn't change his words. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just, uh, he was just amused by the fact that 
every time he was there, I would show up, you know, it yeah. was like, it was like a reliable factor. Uh, yeah. Cole will probably be there, you know, and now <laughs> so, uh, and then of course, when I, when I went into the business, things went, went fast and, um, he started yeah. introducing me to people. The interviews with, with, uh, Frank Zappa are there, you put, place them as transcriptions. Yes. There's a lot of, um, moments when reading it where I'm thinking, wow, this is incredible because I know what's going to, how it, things will pan out for his, his life and his career. And so it's really interesting to see how, um, to have that sort of time capsule. And I think that this book is, if anyone is really interested in Frank Zappa and wants to sort of get a sense of, of how he approached what he did, um, this is a really great uh, way to do that. I don't want this book to be regarded to be pretentious. Mm. It's, it's it's not a biography. It's not yeah. complete. The only thing it is, my personal experience that I want to share with people, and I had the opportunity, thanks to a few people, among them my father, to befriend my idol. Yeah. And and when I was eighteen, and and that was that was so weird. And and the 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 first picture in the book that I took of Frank. Um, I made with my mother's camera, you know, that I borrowed from her and, and yeah. I had a little cheapo cassette recorder. And then uh, that's where it all started because Frank was, it's so much discussed and so much, so well documented and so many stories about him that, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. I just want to uh, present people, my personal appreciation uh, to him and, and to our friendship. And uh, I would never, never, call myself a friend of Frank Zappas if he if he had not told me that I could do that yeah. and he and he would always sign letters and when we were on the phone with each other you know it was always friendly and one journalist said that the the vibe of the book for him was represented by the way that Frank looks on the cover yeah yeah because he's just a friendly guy you know he's just uh, having a good yeah. time my friend Menno made that picture that's what I wanted to share I never intended really to write that book, but there was two people pressing me to do it. The first one was my dad, mm -hmm. also in the business. And the other one was Dweezil, mm -hmm. because I told Dweezil two stories about Frank that I thought that he obviously knew and he didn't know. Yeah. What are you telling me? And and one of the things was, uh, one of the two things that I told him that he didn't know then, on the first album, Freak Out, there's a song called You Didn't Try to Call Me. Wait a minute, I think I got Freak Out here. Yes, I do. And it says, this is the vinyl. It says in the liner notes, You Didn't Try to Call Me was written to describe a situation in which Pamela Zerubica found herself last spring. When I talked to Pamela Zerubica, which, which is also in the book, I thought, what was it about? And she said, well, you know, it's the, the stereotype situation of a girl uh, on a date. <laughs> and... She said, well, I had a date and uh, the guy didn't read. He didn't call me. Yeah. And she told me it was Phil Spector. <laughs> <laughs> and Weasel says, what? <laughs> and we were in a van on the way to the orchestra for that big project. And he says, uh, you should write a book, man. And he says, yeah. and when you do, and when you do, I will write the foreword. Yeah. And he, and he, and he did. did. It's a, it's a wonderful forward to the book. Yeah, Dweezil, Dweezil is such a great guy, and I hope to work with him again real soon. And uh, of course, he's the only Zappa carrying the torch of great musicianship. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's an incredible musician. That's yeah, and yeah. composer. When you made, went to do that very first interview, you know, as you know. What made you think to record it? Was that part of the condition that you were going to record it to put it on the radio? Or was that sort of like, just document it because, oh my God, I this in, I was in high school. I was in high school. <laughs> yeah. Just to prove that it happened. Yes. When I was going through the book, one of the things that I was sort of taking away a lot, that was something that I found unique that I hadn't seen in other, other uh, books or interviews with him really, was you engaged him a lot to talk sort of business. Like how he he went about sort of choosing to do certain things and there's a, there's a period in here i think in the early 80s um where he almost feels a little bit uh cynical towards the idea of touring and he seems a little maybe burned out on that he is his desire to sort of focus more on on fancy music right his classical compositions um and the business of how how the the economics of that affected his decisions 
um, mm-hmm. the cost of having to hire a, a whole orchestra and deciding that that's just too expensive. So he's not going to write for whole orchestras anymore. He gives this this statement about how even the, just the cost of having all the um, manuscripts handwritten out is so expensive that he could just buy another Synclavier, uh, yeah. you know, sampler. And for, for anyone that doesn't know, it's a, that's a computer sampler. It was very ahead of its time, very groundbreaking way to make electronic music. Yeah. So as I was going through this, I had this thought, particularly in this part of this sort of what if. What if Frank hadn't passed away as early as he did and had lived to be in this era of music notation software on a computer like Sibelius or MIDI powered um, orchestral, you know, libraries that you can download, um, you know, and have on your laptop, right? Like this, he was so at the forefront of this technology and it really exploded in the 20 years after he passed and he, he, he missed out on that. And it would have seemed very in tune with where he was going. As someone who knew him and, and was close to him, are there times where you're going, what if, what if Frank was still around? What would he say about this? What are some of those things that you feel like he missed out on or you wish you had his input for today? Um, do you know who Donald Trump is? Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Yes, sure. Yeah. You know how many Frank Zappa freaks from the United States tell me where's Frank when you need him? Yeah, yeah. You no, know, and and uh, of course the what if question is always very hypothetical. I mean, he was he was. Um, I don't want to sound cynical or or dark, but I mean, some people that were very close to him, like George Duke, that I work with. Yeah. I had thanks to Frank, I had the opportunity to work and still still work with the most amazing talents and George Duke was a dear friend. And he said, sometimes when I saw Frank work and rehearse with us, sometimes I just felt that he sort of knew that he didn't have much time. And that's mm. that's why he stuck so much in a relatively short time. Yeah. Frame, you know, he, he, when he died, he was 52. I know. It's crazy. So, so if you, if you look at his legacy, I mean, how, how, how are you going to do that in 52 years? I mean, if, even if you start, in diapers, how are you going to do that? You know, this yeah. the, the music that he put out, besides the music, all the th- other stuff that he did, how are you going to yeah. do that? So it's your sort of lifetime. So, so, so there may have been a factor that he sort of knew that he had to do it now. And, mm-hmm. uh, and of course, I often, because uh, I think of Frank a lot, and of course you see stuff happening today that you think, what, what, what would have happened if he was still around, you know, how would he deal with artificial intelligence? How would he deal with Trump? How would he deal with Biden? How would he deal with um, the fact that there's a war in Europe? You know? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 in my, in the conversations I had with him, we, um, we heavily discussed the, uh, the whole Iraq uh, and the Gulf War and stuff like that. And he was so, um, the guy, I don't want to use the word guy. The man was so hyper intelligent and he kept track of everything that happened in the world you know so his opinion yeah. about the iraq uh, contra affairs about the gulf war about all the stuff that happened with censorship in the united states he was so on top of things and was so, such a spokesman for a lot of people that uh, he would have probably just continued to do that on the other hand you know i work at the conservatory of amsterdam uh at the jazz department where i run a uh department called music business and what i often say to students who who are totally into the jazz world i say what would charlie parker do had he lived today Hmm. because a lot of a lot of people don't know and there's a zappa link there um when charlie parker before he died had one big wish he wanted to go and study composition with edgar Edgar Ferres. oh wow wow you know yeah who was Frank's big idol? So, you know, yeah. what would have happened with the alto saxophone literature had Charlie Parker been alive and had studied with Edgar Ferres? You yeah, know what yeah. I mean? So, um, but that's what it is. His catalog is huge. It's still they're still putting stuff out, right? It's it's really, it's at times it's overwhelming. But I think that's why those of us who are Zappa fans continue to be engaged because there is just so much there. Yeah. It's like you can't listen to it all totally. I, you know, in your conversations with him, it's very clear what a true and honest super fan you are. You 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 know all his recordings, you know all these little details about other live performances, you know, stuff about bootlegs. 
so at times it seems like you almost know a little bit more than he does, right? Um, <laughs> And, and sorry, the last thing is you're also very educated about the compositions too, right? You're not just someone who listens to the music and likes it because well, well, it breaks know, I'm, attitude. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a musician slash composer slash producer and production yeah. has always been my main, my main drive. But I did go to the conservatory. I did study music and electronic music. And so, and Frank knew that. Yeah. And when I first met him, I was in high school. And um, then he found out that I was going to the conservatory and I, mm -hmm. I wanted to be in the business. And he also knew that my father was a radio personality here in Holland, who was also a producer. He he did a lot of production of programming and, and stuff like that. So uh, that's how, how I got to meet Frank through my dad. Yeah. And um, so he knew that I was interested in that. And that's one of the things that I've always find so uh, rewarding is that when I made my first baby steps into the business, he was always mm -hmm. very supportive and and asked yeah. me, about, how are you doing? Can I help you? Is there any stuff that you want to do that I can help you with? And when I really went into the radio and media and music business, that just progressed and became more and more of a um, cooperation rather than the, the master pupil. Uh... Sure, yeah. Well, that was sort of what I, I was curious about because – you know, when you're working with Zappa, a deal is a deal, right? Like sometimes you ask him something and he just says like, yes. And it's like, that's it. Like it's done. It's agreed upon. And it's going to happen. That's right. And, but, but if, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. It goes both ways. Yeah. So if I, if I told him I will do this and this, I'd better do it. Yeah. Well, he, and I did. yeah, he and, gave you some incredible opportunities. I was, it was really yeah, but, amazing. But you, but you don't want to mess up, you know, you don't want to yeah. disappoint him. And it was always, and what all his band members said, and I don't want to compare myself with any of his band members because I was never on a stage with him, but yeah. um, they said we, one of the drives that we had, you know, in my talks with Flo and Eddie, for instance, yeah. is okay, we wanted to do a good show, but the main goal was to make Frank happy and or laugh. Yeah, that's and an incredible, I mean, I, and you knew him, I mean, and you were a fan of his work. So there was a, a, a pedestal perhaps when you first engaged with him. But why do you think that that relationship continued, that you were always striving to um, to to, imp to make him happy in that sense? Or why do you think that band members always felt that way? What was his charm in that sense? Well, one of the big talents that Frank had, and this has been confirmed by a lot of people that I still work with, is that he was capable to let you do stuff that you, before he asked you to do it, you were not aware of that mm. capacity in yourself. Yeah. He would he would lift you up, you know. He would challenge you. I mean, I'm I'm working very very closely now these days as a uh, orchestral manager, so to speak, with uh, with Steve Fai and. Yeah. Uh, and 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 Steve is a perfect example that that Steve said he made me do stuff that I I I didn't know I could do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and and he had a big talent for that. So he talked to if you talk to people, unfortunately he passed away. But I mean, George Duke would also say that he just enriched my musical life. Mm -hmm. He just opened doors for me, and I didn't know that it was possible. And he made me do it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was a big talent of his. Do you, do you, when you were doing those, those tasks for him or, or let's say mixing that one radio show, I think you, the broadcast for, which was, a, you were pretty young, I think early twenties, I think you were doing yeah, that. That was the 1980, the 1980 show in Rotterdam. It was in May. So I had just turned 21. Wow. I mean, you must've been, how did you, I mean, you must've been super nervous. How did you feel? nervous was not the word i was just in a in a different um universe yeah okay no i mean here you are at 21 music student and of course i i knew all the people from the radio station and they were baffled and 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 i i still still don't know if it was a joke by on frank's behalf or whatever but he says okay he said to the big radio station here okay you can record my show it has, it has to be multi-track and uh, the, the the mix should be supervised by this friend of mine. And of course, he knew that my father was working for that same radio company. Yeah. So one of the demands that he had is that I would supervise the mix, you know. Now, the engineer who lives around the corner here, and I saw him this morning on his bike. He's now uh -huh. a pensioner. Um, he was very happy with my presence because I saved him a lot of time because I knew all the music. So I could yeah. cue him all the time, you know, as it's. I didn't we we didn't have to go through the music over and over again to find out what's happening because I knew the music. Yeah. 
and and the mix was relatively okay. I mean, it was yeah. uh, it was it wasn't a a miracle, but uh, there were also some restrictions because Frank had uh, had to made sure that some some connections in the multi tracks were made so that that some things were linked to each other. So mm. if I if I would increase the volume on the keyboards, some of the drum parts would go up also. So it was very hard to make it perfect, but yeah. we did a good job. And do, do you think he did that to sort of like prevent? It from being yeah. a st studio quality, like you know, probably, probably, and and that radio recording, it was broadcast, and uh, it has been bootlegged many, many times on the different titles. I think yeah. the latest version, I don't have any of them, by the way, but uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe one. But the latest is called uh, Ahoy, because that's the name of the venue. Yeah. Uh. So uh, yeah, that was fun, and it made me very, very proud, of course. And I, as I describe in the book, I would call up. I would call up friends and just say, "Hey, by the way, uh, sh should you have the idea to invite me next Saturday to come to a party? I can make it because I'm going to mix a Frank Zappa show." Yeah, I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and I bored. I bored. I bored everyone with it. No, so, that's that's. I mean, when and when you have that opportunity, you're going to make sure yeah. everyone knows, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to ask sort of maybe a sort of a basic Frank Zappa question. <laughs> um, if someone who's, let's say, listening to this interview and they've never listened to a Frank Zappa album before, what album would you tell them to start with? Leather. Oh, okay. All right. Because that has it all. Now, if you had to tell them what album not to start with, what would you say? That's a good question. <laughs> um... That's very hard. I would say the live album called Does Humor Belong in Music. Okay. And and why would you say that's not the great the right place to start? Because you have to know you have to know Zappa's music to yeah. appreciate that album. Cuz you got to know the jokes a bit. And yeah, and you have to be uh, somewhat um immune to electronic drum kits. <laughs> that's a very that's very fair. Very fair, yes. <laughs> Do you have a favorite Zappa album or uh, individual track? Um, not really, because there's so much, and I've been living yeah. with it for such a long time. But if there, if if you really would push me, I would have to go back into my childhood and 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 experience the amazement of uh, discovering that world, and that would be yeah. torn, that would be torn at motels. Yeah, we touched on this a little bit, but it's. There's so much material to yeah. absorb that it's why I keep coming back because I do I do remember my very very first radio performance talking about Frank mm -hmm. and uh, that this was, was before in, you met him correct yes in 1973 yeah. and uh, they let me play one tune and it was from this vinyl album Uncle Meat this is the vinyl version yep. And I still remember doing that. It was in 1973. And, and you know, much later I found out that there's a skull here. And it has 1348 on it. And it took me years to find out why that was on there. But there's a song on there called Dog Breath in the Year of the Plague. Oh. <laughs> and, this, and this is the year of the big plague. Yep. Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, see, these are the little tiny hidden clues that are in Frank's music all the time. I think, you know, you know, when that time I began to really get into Frank's music, yeah. um, he had already he had already passed at that point. I had been familiar, you know, I'd heard Peaches and Regalia stuff like that before he had he had passed away. But you know, I would say probably when I was in college is when I really started to get into the catalog, and at yeah. that point it was you know, all the albums were out. So it was like, what order do you go in? And maybe you weren't always exposed to things in order. And yeah. that's one of the things that's, I think, fascinating about his catalog is how much um, that conceptual continuity there is between early albums and late albums and how things connect all the time. What are some elements of Frank's music that you're still finding um, today or you're hearing in some of the, the posthumous releases that come out that maybe you you didn't, know or appreciate before or didn't make those connections before and the conceptual continuity of his work? Well, you always find out stuff. If you haven't heard something, you find out new stuff, but yeah. it doesn't really change my 
opinion or my total view on his work. One of the things that I um, uh, always find intriguing with Frank's music is that um, despite all the complexity, despite all the bizarreness and the and the virtuosity and and whatever the main factor for me is that there's an ultimate sense of beauty in his best moments he can write stuff that is so beautiful and uh and and tender and gentle and uh, that is that is very almost schizophrenic you know he he always wanted to be or tried out to be this weird or bizarre or ugly or whatever it was but he just couldn't avoid his own talent in yeah. writing the stuff that was so beautiful and it also already started before he had his band because if you go if you go before his first release and if you listen to the scores that he did for those two movies in the 50s or beginning of the 60s yeah. there's a song there's a melody in there that later appeared to be a song called Duke of Prunes mm -hmm. now if you just hear that melody played on a woodwind instrument and with the accompaniment it's like it, it's right in the realm of Satie or Debussy yeah. it's beautiful and you have to remind yourself that he was about in his 20s you know mm -hmm. if he was in his 20s maybe not even and it was so beautiful and uh, that's of course that the result of him having a very unorthodox musical upbringing because mainly being self-taught so it was very original and of course, combined with the amazing talent that he had. For me, as I grow older and li have listened to the music since I was literally 11, mm -hmm. uh, the, the beauty factor is is uh, is becoming the most important factor. Yeah. And now working in orchestra land with Steve Vai, that's one of the things that I think that Steve is um, in the footsteps of Frank that he also has the capacity to combine virtuosity and uh, and amazement to many. Oh, for sure, yeah. Sincere, sincere sense of beauty. You know, you talk with Frank a lot about about bootlegs and sort of other people performing his music. We live in this world where like everyone is stealing things and stick, making a meme out of it, taking quotes out of context and sticking it in. A, maybe it's not even a real quote and they put it on someone's, you know, as if they said it. Zappa has been co-opted a lot in that sense that people like to take his words and use them to suggest one political ideology or another. How, how do you think he would have felt about that? Or do you think he would have been more vocal in politics and um, actually gotten involved in politics had he? Well, he was. I mean, he, he was very outspoken. Yeah. He worked talk shows a lot. When the whole censorship came uh, under Reagan and with the PMRC, he was very outspoken. A lot of artists who were attacked by these people uh, for business reason, kept them out shut, you know? Yeah. For example, is Prince. Exactly, yeah. Prince is the big one, and, yeah. And, uh, and 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 Frank just stood up and says, no, you know, I want to live in a free democracy. I don't accept this. And here, here are my opinions. And um, what he taught a lot of people, and I try to, to keep that example alive, is that he said, um, there are two things in a society that you have to be very careful with. And if those two things are uh, under pressure or are being neglected or whatever, you're in trouble. And the first one is craftsmanship mm -hmm. and the other one is honesty. Yeah. So the combination of craftsmanship and honesty, I think, is one of the backbones of his entire catalog. That That is the common factor in everything that he did. It's 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 devastatingly honest and, uh, <laughs> yes, it, and, 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 and very well done and very well done. Frank, in interviews, um, on, especially on TV, you know, if you look at interviews on Letterman or other places, um, he can be very sardonic, right? And um, cynical and very dry, perhaps. Do you think that that was a sort of character that he was playing in a, in a way to contrast the image that his music sometimes brought? Or was that him? What's your thought on his presence? Well, I don't, I don't, I, I never want to try and speak on his behalf or think on his behalf. But my personal experience is that one of the things that was so baffling about his personality is, was his honesty. Like I said before, mm -hmm. you know, craftsmanship and honesty. So he would just give it to you the way it was. And a lot yeah. of people want, and a lot of people don't want to hear that. Mm. Some, so it could also hurt people, his honesty, but it was honest. Yeah. 
and maybe he was not the biggest diplomat always in in <laughs> relationships with people, you know. But uh, but then again, why, you know, he, he was so so focused on what he was doing and 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 on his work and everything that um, and he gave so many people an opportunity to, yeah. to grow and to explore themselves and to 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 develop their skills or their popularity you know and there's mm -hmm. a lot of people who got a big break thanks to frank not all of those people made good use of that you know yeah. some of them did a lot of people did there's of course there were people who were already famous entering the band like george duke was already famous mm -hmm. flo and eddie you know yeah. people like that were already making a name for themselves but other people who started out with frank later became popular and when they stuck to those principles of being honest and doing your work and paying your dues they would be very successful like vinnie Colliuda, steve Vai, mike keneally and of course you have that whole army of people who didn't make it and those are the people who will gladly talk negatively about frank yeah do you, and, do those, you... and, and don't associate with that to that point of sort of like coming in contact with him. Obviously, we're talking about people that were in the band and then left and how that changed their career trajectories. The interview with Flo and Eddie um, is really great to that, too. They talk a lot about that, how it changed their approach to their own sort of the business of being band leaders. Um, yeah. how, how has Frank changed your approach to what you do both artistically and, you know, through life as just a person? Well, there's a few people who were, when I was very young, had a big influence on me. Mm -hmm. Respect. Frank is definitely one of them. My father is one of them. There was a Dutch producer that none of you know, but he he, he died very young and, and he was a very strong force. Mm -hmm. And through my work, I got a chance to meet a lot of people who were really devoted to their work and really open about their talent and their the way they, they, they wanted to be in the business. So I think that what Frank taught me, and I have had confirmation all along the way until this week with students I have on the mm. repertory, is that the honesty factor is the most important. I mean, you don't have to, if you if you believe in what you do, and if you are convinced that what you do is, you don't have to 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 to, to present the best of what you have, but if you really know that you try to make it as good as possible, you don't you don't have to answer to anybody and that's what frank told me you don't have to answer to anybody as long as you are convinced that what you do is sincere yeah then then it's okay and and if people like it that's fine if a lot of people don't like it that's fine too you know mm -hmm. and that's also what i discuss all the time with with uh, with steve fi uh is that that is um that is what 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 drives us that is our drive you know uh, and that that that's why we talk about frank so much is that he showed us the way to uh to be faithful to your own uh, mm -hmm. talent and if you do it in an honest way then why not you know the yeah. why not question is there. why not yeah how does that sort of life advice or approach though change when the artistic talents that you're working the best at and giving it your all to answer to no one when, you know, in, in Frank's case or, or in Steve Vai's case, let's say, there's been financial success attached to that. How do those two worlds, um, you know, function independently of one another? If those pieces you're making, like if Frank had not made Freak Out, would you think he, and if that opportunity hadn't come along, do you think he would have still been Frank Zappa at the end? Do you think he would have found a way to to find his his footing to make a name for himself? Or was that just... A lucky happenstance. I think the answer can only be yes because R Freak Out was already that what you described. Yeah, because he was a classical composer. Yeah, what, whatever <laughs> he was, a, he was a he was a composer. He was a composer, yeah. And he didn't get his music played. Yeah, so he took an alternative route and joined a band. Mm -hmm. And um, so so he already the the first steps in his career were all already what you described yeah and that's why i think the answer would, would be yes his talent would have come out anyhow hey, maybe not today but that's another <laughs> question that's that's what he says himself yeah in one of the talks is that if i had to start today i wouldn't have a chance but in those those days um for him to make the decision to try to get a uh, foot in the door through rock and roll was yeah. a wise decision as a composer but he was already composing then i was thinking about your interview in the book right 
um, with Flo and Eddie. And they're, they talk about the effort that went into sort of almost reforming their image after Frank so that they could get other types of work, you know, having gone from the turtles to Zappa and then trying to find what their new path was going to be. And Eddie even references the, his disappointment in songs like Magdalena. They sort of suggest that Frank in some ways is like self-sabotaging, like to prevent himself from reaching the level of, of fame or success or popularity that he could have with his talents um, by sticking a lyric in here or there to make it unfriendly for radio. And, and yeah. what's your feeling on that? Do you think that he was intentionally doing that or, or yes. what, you, yeah, you do but, think so? Well, you know, when I was in Paris, uh, when he did the Pierre Boulez uh, recordings, uh, we had a lengthy conversation, which is for a major part also in the book. And he is talking about an album that he put out called The Man from Utopia. Yeah. And there's two songs on there. One is called The Dangerous Kitchen and uh, the other one is called The Radio is Broken. And he said that people in his organization, in his office, like his wife and his secretary and other people, <laughs> were just begging him not to put that on the album because they thought it was so ugly. And he says, but, you know, so, and of course, and that's one of the mottos. And uh, I should I should run upstairs and show you a business card that he once gave me. One of the big questions, and I also use that as a motto in the book, is that Frank had one thing that he always said, that if somebody tells you that you can't do something, the only question that you can ask is, why not? Yeah, right. Yeah. And he, and he even had a company called Why Not? This is the business card that he used when he was in the um, doing business in uh, Czechoslovakia and Russia. And... Yeah. Now, I sort of I'm wondering, like, what happened to that company? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> right. It would have been part of the the Zappa family trust after he passed, right? I mean. Yeah, but it was just you know it was it was of course a lot of uh, I don't know the the real details, but yeah, it was a lot of PR kind of stuff very connected to his personality so yeah. when he when he got sick and didn't do it anymore and, and of course as i write in the book is that the u.s government said to Faklav Havel that uh they they didn't want him to do business with zappa you've played i think such a an amazing role in your whole career of getting frank's music a lot of radio airplay and attention the supplement um show which you talk about um quite a bit um yeah. and of course the interviews that supported that which which everyone can read in Frank and Co. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but I think then also these live performances, um, you know, with, with Steve Vai, can you talk a little, a little bit about the Steve Vai um, performances? I met Steve in 82 when he was mm -hmm. in Frank's band. And then uh, I was the, um, I, with my good friend Menno, I had a little production company in the eighties and we did all kinds of odd jobs. And one of the things that we did was importing in Holland uh, Steve Vai's first solo album called Flexible. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I I just whipped out. This is, uh, you know, Laurel Fishman is a very famous rock and roll person and a good friend of Frank and and, uh, and Steve's. And this is this is the, the handwritten contract <laughs> from 1985. Wow. In which it said, you may refer to yourself as official distributors of Steve Vai merchandise, but not exclusive, okay? <laughs> I love this. Look at this. And this is an original Laurel Fishman contract. And um, <laughs> so uh, so we started doing that. And then Steve and I lost contact for a while. And then in the late 90s, I decided to uh, reestablish the contact. And uh, I made a big radio special with him which was basically just based on his career. Sure. I said to him after doing the interview for that radio special, which was in Sacramento, uh, California, I said, to him, do you have any dreams? And he said, uh, within a second, yes, I do. I want to work with orchestras. Hmm. And then some out some sort of naivety or I wouldn't use the word stupidity because it's, it's turned out to be very nice, but I, I just said, okay, I'll, I'll fix it. <laughs> but I, the only orchestra I had access to was the uh, was the Metropol Orchestra in Holland, so I started uh, creating funds and writing subsidy plans and all kind of stuff. And so I managed to get a huge, lush budget in the beginning of two thousand, two thousand two, or I think it was two thousand three, to do the first performances with the Metropol Orchestra and Steve. And then two years later, it was such a success that two years later we did it again and we brought in television. Mm -hmm. and they recorded it uh, professionally and. Steve put it out as a DVD. 
which is called Sound Theories. That was a big success, but then that that was that. And then yeah. I thought we should have a next step. So I put him in touch with a symphony orchestra in the north of Holland called the North Netherlands Orchestra. And I had already worked with them with um, uh, Laurie Anderson and Lou Reed and Terry Riley and Todd Rundgren. And I said to uh, the, the artistic manager, Marcel Mandos, great guy, you should work with Steve Vai. And so he commissioned him some orchestra pieces and there was a whole Steve Vai festival. So that was that was a big success. I also commissioned him to write a saxophone quartet, which is not finished yet. Okay. And so things were building up. Yeah. And about five years ago, Steve decided that he really wanted, besides his uh, fame as a guitar virtuoso and a uh, guitar legend, he wanted to more and more explore and develop his uh composership mm -hmm. and so he sort of commissioned me to um to do that we just finished another concert with uh with the metropole at a new festival here in eindhoven in may but what we did is and that's pretty unique last year we uh, spent three weeks in the studio with the metropole orchestra and two weeks with a orchestra from finland to do studio productions of all steve's orchestra work wow wow and that's going to be released uh, whenever he has time to finish it. Yeah. And with the Philharmonic Orchestra from Tampere, Finland, a beautiful town, Tampere, we are now going to do one or two shows in September, uh, live performances of that music. Yeah, sure. So, so Steve has now appointed me to be his... The official title on my business card is Steve Fies, Manager of Orchestral Endeavors. I love it. I love it. Uh, me too. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I work. I work a lot with, and I really believe that the same with as with Frank is that, besides being a great performer and a great guitar player and band leader, yeah. et, cetera, et cetera, his compositional talents, his 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 very unique language as a composer, is something that for me connects him directly with Frank and Debussy and Ferrer. Yeah, yeah. I can tell you a little anecdote of to Please to wrap. I have a ten year old son called uh, Fabian in English, Fabian. And uh, he plays guitar. Okay. And, uh, and Steve Fai is sort of his um, godfather. Pia, okay. Pia, Pia and Steve are very close friends of ours. And uh, so they, they um, I have a 13-year-old daughter called Jasmine Ziva and uh, a 10-year-old son called uh, Fabian. And he plays the guitar. And uh, they, they refer to, to him as Uncle Steve. Yeah. And so when he got his first guitar lessons here in Hilversum. There was this really nice guy. He's about 30 and he's like a real laid back guy. And he gives him his first lessons playing chords and stuff like that. And, yeah. uh, but um, my son also has a, um, a Ibanez gem that I got from Steve. So he plays on it here. Yeah. And he's only 10. And uh, so after eight or 10 lessons this guy says to him lawrence he says uh so fabian do you like uh do you like to play do you practice every day yep and do you practice every day 15 minutes yep and you so you enjoy it yes well i'm glad so see you next week and then fabian says by the way my uncle plays the guitar too and he says oh great what's his name and he says steve <laughs> <laughs> and then his teacher thought he was making a joke <laughs> Not very much la later, last May, we were recording with the Metropole Orchestra in Hilversum, and Steve and I picked Fabian up from his guitar lesson. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so uh, there was the talk of the town that day. And I hope Steve had the fan blowing his hair back. And the... <laughs> <laughs> Well, you'll be you'll be amazed when the orchestra stuff of Steve is going to be released because it's it's so good. It's it's one of the uh, the main um, adventures I'm now uh, developing it's it's the, 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 there's going to be a lot the coming two years that's great we're talking about some high-tech companies about technical innovation projects and so of course he's still mr guitar touring the world of course yeah it's this different side of him yeah that i'm involved in which is so interesting and so good so um yeah let's keep in touch about no, that please do i mean i i will be happy to help you promote that as right. much as i can yeah wonderful it's, um wonderful yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. I mean, without a doubt. Is there ever going to be an audio version of this book that will just use those actual recorded conversations? There's only one answer to that question, Jeff. Okay. And it is yes. Yes. Okay. Is there is there a timeline for that? 
<laughs> There's only one question to that, and that is no. But okay. I'm, I, am, I am talking with Jawbone, uh, yeah. my publisher in London, great publisher, by the way, mm -hmm. who, by the way, are going to release one of these days a book of Mark Volman of the Turtles. Oh, wow. And, uh, and and they also publish a great book about my the, the reason why I'm with Jawbone is I I owe that to my friend Gary Lucas who okay. uh, wrote a book about his experiences with Jeff Buckley mm -hmm. and Jawbone and I are now talking about uh, the possibility of releasing it as an audio book because all of the conversations in the book I have an audio yeah I think that's one of the things that's incredible like the the conversation with Pamela Zarubica and yeah. Jimmy Carl Black are also really fascinating too because. You are getting these firsthand yeah. testimonials of that experience, and um, you know, to to get that additional perspective of that time yeah. frame, yeah. it's yeah. really incredible. How does it make you feel um, to now be the person who's being interviewed as the firsthand source? Old it makes you feel old. <laughs> Do you feel like there's a a um? like a responsibility though that you have to no it's no. it's it's just it's just for the for the for the for the sake of the music and the yeah. uh and the and the connections that it, it generates and main mm -hmm. in my work now with Steve when Frank when Frank did this oh one, yeah yeah no well, Ken Nagano is in the book because mm -hmm. yes those, yeah that's a yeah in this period I met Ken Nagano and that's an incredible story of how you end up meeting him too like yeah yeah and just in my little village here, right across the street here. And uh, and and when I was doing the recordings last year in May with Steve in the other hall of the uh, of the uh, orchestra facility where we were rehearsing, Ken Nagano was rehearsing. Hmm. And and I found out that Steve had never met Ken Nagano. Oh, wow. So we have, I have great pictures of the three of us. And uh, but he was really impressed to meet Ken Nagano because yeah. Ken Nagano is like a hero. And uh, and so I introduced the two to each other, and then Ken Nagano says, "Oh, I'm so happy! I know what you're doing with Co. And uh, I, I have quite some contact with with Ken Nagano because of the book and and and, sure. and our history." And he says, "I'm so happy that you are working with Go, blah blah blah." And he said, uh, "And I still remember hearing your name all the time when I was doing the London Symphony Orchestra stuff with Frank." Oh wow! He says, "What do, what do you mean?" He says, "Well, every time the orchestra committee." Or some people from the union would come up to me and Frank, with a uh, with a part from the score, and tell us that this is not performable. This is too hard. <laughs> Every time Frank would say, "Well, Steve, I would have no problem with that." <laughs> and says, no, did he really say that? And yeah. He says, yes, well, he did. The, the original stunt guitarist, right? I mean, that was his credit, yeah. right? He's just a superhuman amount of talent in those fingers. It's incredible. So yeah. there was a there was, so so those connections are, and that's maybe going to be my next book. How 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 connected the world is actually, you know, people yeah. you know him, you know her, and it's all. Well, the the obviously the Ken Nagano story in the book, the the uh, Maladin Zarubica story is really fascinating in the book. Um, it also is a great, amazing testament to the detail of Frank's memory. Do you think that uh, that was a defining characteristic of who he was? Yes, and that's that's the only comparison I ever make with me and Zappa himself, is that it, the same goes for my memory. I have I, I talked to Steve about stuff that happened forty years ago, and I just have a an exact memory of that event. Probably I forgot a lot of th stuff, but that you don't know. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but of course, I had my archive to double check stuff. Sure, yeah. Aids yeah. and stuff like that. Frank is. I would say very famous for his consumption of coffee and cigarettes <laughs> as someone who very, and it's a very touching story in this book, um, by the way, about um, that cup of coffee that you had. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I, and I, it's a really good story. And, and I debated it whether or not I should ask you to tell it, but I feel like people should read the book. Frank. That's Cowell. right. That's right. <laughs> um, Let them read it. Yes. Buy the book. Um, and then, and then they can also, then they can also read why I have this. Yes, yes, and we'll go. Yes, we'll get to the gas mask. Yes, for sure. Um, <laughs> so my question about coffee is, you know, as someone who drank Frank's coffee with him, how was the quality of his coffee? Very good. Very strong. good. Strong. Now, it's. I don't know if you know this is, is if or not, but 
did at one point did he travel with an espresso machine at one point? Do you know if that's true? That is true. His, it is his, true. his bodyguard, who I also knew, who was a fantastic character, John Smothers, who unfortunately passed away also. He he was carrying around that coffee. I love it. Which he hated. <laughs> Always have to make that goddamn coffee, he said. Yes. Mm. Can we talk a little bit about that gas mask? Sure. Let me get it out. Yeah. This is an original 1950s gas mag that was laying around in Frank's house that he used to play with. It's it's also in some of the videos. Yes. And this is like when he from when he was a child. Yes. When he yeah. was a teenager, he would play with this the thing. And um, <laughs> it's in the book, but yes. Yeah, so, uh, it's a, it's a he, funny he, story. He, I mean, put, he put a little prank. He did, had a little prank with his then secretary, who was still a very, very dear friend of mine, Susan Rubio. She she was once entering her office and um, uh, she was doing the mail and she was wearing a, a little skirt skirt because it was hot, a warm day and and she sat on her chair and she felt something you know, <laughs> and she looked and and she saw this gas mask looking up and she was sitting on it, and she said what is this you know, <laughs> and she hears giggling, and she turns around. And she sees Frank and John Smothers, his yeah. buddy, peeking, peeking into her office and going like, like little what, tiny. What, what a great joke! Yeah. And 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 as I say, the book here is one of the great composers from the twenty first century, having fun with a gas mask and a secretary. And yeah. like, what is it? Acting and then, very and, and childish then she, in a way, yeah. And then and she took it and she could take it home and. Uh, and she said, you can have it. And then I was at the uh, L.A. Uh, airport going back to Amsterdam and I had it in my hand luggage. And there was this huge guy at customs or security. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, so my, my little hand baggage went through the um, X-ray and he was on his own. And I don't know how I describe it in the book, but this is what happened. It went through the X-ray and he was looking and he went like. Because he saw a gas mask, which is officially very officially, U.S. Army property. Yeah. And he says, what is this? And I said, well, it's a, obviously it's a gas mask. <laughs> and he says, but what are you thinking? Do you think you can take this with you just like this? I mean, and he was totally puzzled, like, what is this? Yeah. And I says, well, I got it from a friend, and um, it, it belonged to Frank Zappa. And he says, what do you mean? I said, well, it belonged to Frank Zappa and now it's mine. And I wanted to take it home. And he turned out to be a Zappa fan. He says, really? He says, okay, put it back, go away. So he just yeah. let me, he just let me through. It's and so wonderful. I have a, so I have a piece of US Army property in my little Ziva Sound Odyssey. It's uh it's sort of another one of those moments where Frank said it's okay, so it just gets a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We talked about this a little bit in this idea of, of doing a, a deal as a deal with Frank. And obviously you got to follow through on that and, and not disappoint. How did that business relationship change once Gail um, was sort of the head of, of Zappa Enterprises? After Frank's passing, I didn't have serious business dealings with the family trust unless you want to mention the fact that I did the world premiere of Civilization Phase 3 mm -hmm. and that I was involved as a producer in the Holland Festival 2000 project, which turned out to be a legal disaster. Um, and that was for Turner Motels, right? It was a live performance? Well, right? Turner Motels was pretty good, but the most baffling thing in that, in that, in that week was a performance by the Metropole Orchestra with special guest Bruce Fowler, mm -hmm. And uh, that was probably one of the best Metropole Orchestra performances I've ever witnessed. Uh, and the set list was amazing. And the band played amazing in the Paradiso in Amsterdam. Yeah. The, there was a whole, I described it in my book, there was a whole legal fuck up with that whole situation. And uh, that has not yet been resolved, but there's some light in the tunnel. Oh, okay. I was going to ask. Yeah. So there's some light in the tunnel, but uh, so do you no, think, think that I, will I, ever come out? Do you think we'll ever hear that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that's I'm, work I'm working on it. Okay. Well, fingers but crossed. I don't, but I don't I don't have any uh I don't have any contact with the Zappa Family Trust. Uh I do I do have a lot of contact with Dweezil though. Okay. Uh, because I produced a very big concert in 
I think it was 2017, uh, an evening called Dweezil Zappa's Orchestral Favorites, where we did pieces by Zappa, pieces by Steve Fai, and by Dweezil. And oh, wow. we, we commissioned him to do a piece for orchestra, which was orchestrated by his bass player, Kurt Morgan, which is a charming piece, 12-minute piece. And uh, so my contact with Dweezil is very nice. Well, Co, thank you very much for, for talking and, and sharing your, your stories and, and memories here. Um, you know, I, I really would like to encourage people to to purchase the book, Frank and Co. I think the, the experience you had as just, like you said, a, a high school student getting to meet him, that first interaction is really incredible. Um, and then all those subsequent, you know, years of continuing to meet with him your sort of own sort of like development as an, as an adult and responsibilities growing and changing and that very touching sort of uh, cup of coffee at the end too. It's, it is an honest book. It is not pretentious. It is, is very pure. And I think that you should be very proud of it. So thank you very, very much, uh, Jeff, uh, also for your attention to this. And, uh, and I don't want to scare you, but do you know, there's some guitars behind you? <laughs> yes, there might, there's one or two perhaps. Yes. <laughs> yes, there's a, there's a few hidden there. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Thanks. Thank you, Co. And um, and to anyone who's who's watching, um, please obviously um, you know, if you like this video, like and subscribe. And Co, do you have um, do you want to see if you want to give me links or, or to websites? I'll make sure they're all in the description. But is there anything you want to particularly promote right now, other than you know the well, Steve High concert just ended? But is there stuff coming up? There's a lot of stuff coming up, but one of the first things that I would like to pay attention to is that the, the website of Jawbone Press in London is very, very good. And they also have distribution in Canada and the US, and uh, they do a great job in promoting the book. And uh, we're working on the audio version of it. So yeah. uh, so jawbonepress.com is the, the place to go. I say to everyone, read the book. And when it comes out on audio, then you can listen to the book. Thank you very much, Jeff. It was a nice, uh, nice experience. Thank you. All right. And uh, and we're we're no longer no longer live, I guess. Oh, I know. I wanted to ask you one one last Zappa question. Um, off, record. off the record. Well, I can. All right. Off the record, whatever, or on the record. Whatever, whatever. Whatever. I'd like to ask on the record if I can. Oh yeah, sure.